Yeah, when you guys asked me, uh, when, why did I become a Christian? I mean, a lot of things came to mind, and it, my story goes way back to when I was a kid. I, I was not raised in a Christian home, so I certainly wasn't um, indoctrinated to be a Christian. Uh, I wasn't even aware of many of the things that I now know about Christianity. You know, I'd never read a Bible as a kid or growing up or anything like that. I was raised in a, in a Jewish home, so I didn't know anything about Jesus. Um, so anyways, uh, at about the age of 10, I was kicked out of Hebrew school for telling my rabbis that I didn't believe in God and that I believed in evolution. Um, I was an atheist and a pretty outspoken one as well. And I remained that way until about 2006. Now, June 28, 2006, I watched uh, a movie called The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Um, and after the movie was done, it says that the, the court trial in the movie was based on a true story, which made me curious. So I started doing a little bit of research into the story of the exorcism of Emily Rose, and in the chat rooms, or not the chat room, the message board forum on the Internet Movie Database, imdb.com, someone had a link to uh, Dr. Kent Hovind's seminars uh, at Creation Science Evangelism. So I started watching those videos, and during those videos, um, it wasn't, at first, it wasn't the arguments that he was making that really led me to believe in God. Or rather, I just had sort of a, an epitome or a moment of, uh, revelation, I suppose, that I just, I realized that I did believe. Um, and through that, I mean, I just, God became very tangible to me. I, I, I suppose this would be considered a subjective experience of God, and I couldn't convince you of it. I just experienced something uh, very tangible to me. And then throughout his seminars, you know, there's uh, about 17 hours worth of material to go through. During his seminars, I became more and more convinced that um, God was leading me, that he was showing me things and I became I became a Christian. Now there there are more things to say other than that. I mean it's far more nuanced, but that would be the summary uh, of my experience. What scientific things did Hoven say that really in particular uh, grabbed my attention and and really to this day still uh, persuades me to believe that what what I believe now is true. Um, and I found his criticisms mainly of uh, of evolution theory. Many of the things that I was taught growing up in school, which made me initially reject my Jewish faith and my Jewish upbringing, those were the things that I think Hovind did the best job of, um, uh, of critiquing, um, particularly in regards to things like abiogenesis, uh, macroevolution, um, and then critiquing the various so-called evidences for evolution, such as homology and uh, you know, the fossil record, or, or stratification, or you know, geology, things like these. So uh, whatever, whatever interests you, whatever you want to talk about, we, we can talk about. I mean, I guess maybe the first place to start is, do you, do you accept now that the majority of Hovind's arguments are demonstrably, scientifically incorrect? Uh, no, no, I do not. Um, uh, do you accept that all the ones that I have specifically addressed are wrong? Uh, we just started this conversation, and I don't know of any that you've specifically addressed. Um, well, let's take, for instance, oh, um, yeah, Hoban's arguments about lunar recession, seeing as these are uh, simple and easy calculations to perform. Um, Hoban um, says that this shows that the Earth can't be millions of years old, whereas if you just extrapolate the current rate of lunar recession, um, you know, you, you find out that the Earth's day was, whatever, 16 hours long, four and a half billion years ago, and the Moon was about half the distance it is now. I mean, Hoban's arguments are um, cataclysmically wrong. His, his concept of timekeeping, you know, this idea of leap days, he doesn't understand the difference between the Earth's slowdown, the actual rate that the Earth is slowing down and it's spinning, and the, the way that we actually keep track of time in years, which is the number of revolutions you get of the Earth per orbit of the Earth, right? He doesn't understand the difference between those two, which is why he, he, um, extrapolates these, um, uh, these errors that he makes, and he calculates that the Earth was spinning, um, you know, millions of revolutions per second a million years ago or something. I mean, okay, so the guy is just directly. demonstrably wrong. Okay, and that may very well be the case, but I didn't find that to be the convincing part of his argument concerning lunar recession. But you do accept that, um, okay, so what, what is the convincing part of his argument concerning lunar recession? Uh, 
Sure. Well, the moon is not static in its relation to the Earth. Either it's moving closer or it's moving farther away. Those are our only two options. And if it's moving towards the Earth, that means if Earth's gravity had caught it and it's now moving towards the Earth, uh, we would be in a, you know, we'd be in Why a... Why would it be moving towards the Earth? Well, if it was caught by Earth's gravity? Uh, no, I mean, it can't be uh, caught by Earth's gravity. You need a third body. Um, otherwise, it just comes in with the same energy it goes out with. You need at least three bodies for gravitational capture. But isn't it, uh, main, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but isn't it the belief that the moon was part of the Earth and it broke off? I mean, I have a no. uh, textbook here in front of me. Uh, okay. but, uh, yeah, some of the early ideas of the moon were a little crazy, but now it's it's more or less accepted that... Um, from the composition of the moon, the dating of the rocks on the moon, that uh, there was a uh, collision of the proto-Earth and a Mars-sized body about four and a half billion years ago. Um, and this explains a lot of the characteristics of the Earth-Moon system. Okay, so you believe that the, the moon is a... Uh, it's, it's not, its origin is not from the Earth, it's a... It's a no, from the summer... Sorry, go ahead. Well, yes and no. I mean, it, it depends. Seeing as um, we have no real name for these two bodies prior to their collision, yeah, okay, it was part of the Earth. The composition of the Moon and the Earth. Hold Earth's on, hold on. So you said that, wait, I'm sorry, maybe I'm misunderstanding. So the Moon was or was not part of the Earth at some point in the past? Well, that depends. When was the Earth actually the Earth? I mean, at what part of accretion do you call it the Earth? But yeah, I mean, so, let, let, I, let's, let's ditch the semantics. Yes, it was part of the Earth. Then, well, well, hold on. How can you say it was part of the Earth, and then when I asked you, it, was it an extra, was it something that was from an external source that came into the Earth's orbit, or was it part of its body then broke off? I think uh, uh, I need to clarification When you get a collision of two bodies, yeah, it throws up a lot of debris. Some of that debris will accrete and fall back to the, the planet. Other parts will stay in orbit, where they will also gravitationally accrete. That is the uh, prevailing um, uh, theory for lunar formation. And it has the moon forming. It, it explains so many um, attributes of the Earth-Moon system. Like, for instance, um, uh, why is there a paucity of craters on the near side and lots of them on the far side. I mean, if you actually look at the geometry of this thing, the moon should be equally cratered on all sides if the ages of those surfaces are equal. And they're not. And it's basically, there is um, the, from the gravitational accretion of the tightly locked body, you actually get more heat on the near side than the far side, which is why the near side of the moon is younger Right? It was molten longer than the far side. Okay, well, I would simply respond that if the moon and the Earth were once one body, a collision occurred, so then the moon began its formation somewhere in the orbit of the Earth, you still have the question of why is it moving away um, as opposed to moving towards the Earth, given the scenario that you, you just... Uh, and that's high school physics. I mean, it, it's not moving away because of m momentum. It's, it's moving away because of momentum transfer from the Earth's spin to the Moon's orbit. And the reason for that is because there is liquid water on the Earth's surface. You take that water away, and the later rate of lunar recession will essentially drop to zero. Uh, 